This program is intended to be general in nature and should not be used as a substitute for advice from a qualified health provider. On Health Matters Television for Life, starting from scratch after a brain injury. I was basically an 18-year-old baby. A young woman hurt in a car accident navigates months of therapy. I can remember relearning how to add and subtract. And then goes back to college. Her story of recovery and what everyone should know about traumatic brain injury and concussions. Right now on Health Matters. Health Matters is made possible by our viewers, the friends of KSBS, and by Providence Healthcare. I'm Dr. Andrew Boulay, and when my wife had a cardiac arrest, I chose Providence because I knew that everything we needed for her complex care was available from the emergency room to radiology to the nursing staff to the specialists we needed for her care. I'm Arnie Peterson, and I'm an orthopedic surgeon, and I work at Sacred Heart for Providence Medical Group. When I needed my hip replaced, I chose Providence because of the professionalism and the care that I knew I'd receive. I never thought twice about going anywhere else. Good evening, I'm Teresa Lukens. Every year, millions of people suffer from brain injuries. More than half are bad enough to go to the hospital. Tonight, we'll be examining traumatic brain injury, often referred to as TBI. We'll also look at concussions, which are the most common and least serious type of brain injury. And here to bring their expertise is our panel for this program. Dr. Craig Panos is with Kootenai Clinic Family Medicine in Coeur d'Alene. He specializes in concussion care, sports medicine, and emergency medicine. Ramona Pinto is the Eastern Washington Resource Manager for the Brain Injury Alliance of Washington and a certified brain injury specialist. And Dr. Keith DeSouza is board certified in brain injury medicine. He works at St. Luke's Rehabilitation Institute. And finally, Dr. Amatos Manhas is with Inland Neurosurgery and Spine Associates at Providence Neurosurgery Institute. He specializes in neurosurgery. And I want to welcome all of you and thank you for being here for this uh, important discussion. I also want to remind our audience that we are streaming live on Facebook this evening if you'd like to join us there. And we welcome your phone calls uh, by phone or by email for our panel this evening. So we are talking about brain injury. Dr. Manhaus, describe and explain to us what we're talking about when we say uh, TBI, concussion, and there's also ABI that we might be getting into this evening. Uh, well, first of all, thanks for having me on the program. It's great to be here and with my colleagues here. Uh, traumatic brain injury is kind of a general term for all kinds of injuries to the brain, uh, whether it's the substance of the brain or the vessels or the covering of the brain. Um, as a neurosurgeon, we characterize them as mild, moderate, or severe injury. And so with that in mind, when we start talking about concussion, that's considered a milder type of traumatic brain injury. Um, and it's usually temporary in its effects, so patients often describe having neurological symptoms, and um, oftentimes they may not have any sort of structural uh, damage, at least on our uh, typical imaging studies like CT, so. And what's, uh, what about an ABI? Acquired so, brain injury? Acquired brain injury is also more of a general term. Uh, we usually stick to TBI and concussion. I, we don't usually use ABI, uh, but maybe uh, my colleagues may have more to say to, about that. Mm -hmm. Ramona, uh, talk about ABI because this is a term you brought up to me. Right, we use ABI in reference to strokes, Parkinson's, anything where there's been anoxia. And so there's a limit of oxygen going to the brain. And so we incorporate that because there are varying descriptions for that. Mm -hmm. So it is a broad and general description. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Panos, what are some of the, the leading causes of a traumatic brain injury? I think it might surprise some people to hear this answer. Oh, sure. Uh, well, we see obviously uh, all causes uh, from common things, uh, motor vehicle accidents, uh, on the job injuries, falls which occur in the home or uh, in the workplace. Um, obviously, we see them in sports. Uh, uh, really uh, in all facets of life. I, really anything that we do puts us at some risk and obviously some things more. So. And are some people more at risk than others? Well, certainly anyone who has uh, any pre-existing, uh, you know, we call them comorbidities, things that make them more likely to fall. Um, again, 
certainly uh, there's some occupations that put you at great risk, uh, certain sports that are certainly higher risk than others uh, to, to suffer an injury. Um, but, you know, honestly, I've had, for example, you know, high level sports athletes who uh, have had multiple concussions but never actually got it in their sport. So, um, so again, they are unfortunately ubiquitous in our sick society. Mm -hmm. We do see them a lot. So We're going to get into uh, quite a bit of the recovery and the rehab when it comes to a brain injury, and that's where St. Luke's comes in. Talk about um, the work that, that you do there with brain injury patients. Um, so I primarily see outpatient brain injuries. So once they're in the inpatient brain injury program, uh, and then they get uh, they go to the outpatient side. That's when I see them. Or I get a lot of referrals from the community for people who have had brain injuries, similar to what Dr. Panos does, either sports related or uh, in at work or at home. Uh, but St. Luke's as a whole does uh, a lot more with brain injury than just what I do. They have the they also have a huge inpatient department, which focuses a lot on the very severe brain injuries for people who have been hospitalized, who have had surgery, uh, who have, say, for example, had a heart attack and now have had low oxygen to their brain and now have a brain injury because mm. of that. So people like that who are too high level to go home, uh, or sorry, too low level to go home, uh, they, uh, St. Luke's provides that service where it helps get them and their family trained so that then the goal is for them to go home. Wow, so many pieces to this. Um, let's talk about diagnosis because that can be um, a little difficult in breaking that down. We talked about the different types of brain injury. So where do you begin to make a diagnosis on how severe uh, a brain injury is? Well, we're helped with um, a lot of the uh, practitioners in the field uh, from EMS to the emergency uh, medicine doctors at the hospital. Uh, they come in and uh, do a you know, primary survey and they're able to tell whether or not, you know, a patient has a traumatic brain injury. And um, so then once there is a suspicion for uh, an injury, then they get us involved. Um, but again, it's basically doing a thorough exam, um, looking at a patient's level of consciousness and examining the patient to make sure, um, you know, we understand what's going on. Are there scans involved or, or those Initi type of tests? Yeah, initially there are uh, scans that are done, especially if a patient has lost consciousness or um, has difficulty um, remembering what happened. So just some of those um, basic um, emergent functions. Then also if they have any weakness or they're having difficulty with the speech, um, as you mentioned, acquired brain injuries uh, like stroke um, uh, can also lend to that um, avenue of, of um, basically diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And so. where you begin the treatment then. Right. Mm -hmm. right. We hear the term um, Dr. Panos concussion protocol now. It's become commonplace, especially in the sports world. What mm -hmm. does that mean? Well, uh, we've tried to sort of make the system work so that we can identify uh, injuries when they occur. And then really the goal is once you identify to try and prevent you know, more serious injury, um, identify those people who need kind of more higher level care immediately. So, uh, for example, in a football game uh, where an athlete is injured, um, I think people see the NFL concussion protocol or mm -hmm. something. Um, you know, what we try to do is we try to identify those people who may have had the injury or obviously have had the injury, um, bring them aside, do a sideline evaluation, and then really determine, you know, are they having an injury? If they do, um, you know, is that injury stable? Is it progressive? Do we need to seek, you know, care at an emergency room? Um, is that somebody who can be watched, for example, by a trainer? Um, for kids specifically uh, in injuries, we try to avoid any return to, uh, you know, the activity that they were doing before. So if an athlete gets injured um, and shows signs of a possible concussion, generally the protocol is to keep them out, um, partially because, you know, sometimes symptoms don't show up right away. And often in my practice, I'll see someone who got injured and, you know, was pulled out, but then subsequently will get their headache when they went home that evening, or um, they'll really have trouble the next morning or when they try to go to school and can't uh, participate in, in math class and don't know what's going on. So mm -hmm. um, sometimes we don't really see the outward signs until then. So Yeah. In fact, you see that quite often, don't you? Yes. Yes. We And we try and accommodate and figure out which direction they need to go for resources. I mean, they, they might need to see a neuropsychologist, they might need to have an assessment done. Uh, if they need accommodations within the school system, then we work with that. Mm -hmm. 
So you're seeing, you have people come to the Alliance then weeks, months sometimes, after the initial injury? Sometimes even years because Initially, people are not aware of what their baseline is necessarily. So until things start to go a little astray for them, and especially if it's a child that can't really explain what's happening with being overstimulated or having headaches, they're not necessarily attributing that to the concussion that, that they initially had suffered. Mm -hmm. So there can be a, a number of, of different symptoms. What typically will people start to see or experience? That, I guess, is there is such thing as typical? <laughs> Um, there are some symptoms that are some complaints, depending on what you want to call it, that occur uh, initially and some that can occur days or weeks later. Uh, often the most common initial symptoms are headache, nausea, dizziness, vertigo, um, light sensitivity, sensitivity to noise. Uh, later on, uh, people can have other symptoms such as uh, fear of crowds, fear of uh, a PTSD, loss of interest in their day-to-day -day activities, which is called anhedonia, um, and other such symptoms as well. So it's not something that's okay on day one, you're gonna experience everything that uh, can potentially go wrong after a brain injury. Mm. So this can go on for quite some time. Uh, yes, yeah, that's correct. Yeah, yeah. And, and experiencing different symptoms in the process Right. Uh, of recovery? It, it, do we call that in, in the process of recovery? Yes. Okay. Each injury is very individual. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, if you take four people and give them the same injury, you'll have probably four different outcomes, four different duration of symptoms, four different presentations of what each person feels. Um, and it's really, you know, oftentimes hard to predict uh, who's going to be the ones who take longer. Um, I think, you know, most recently there was a study done uh, about loss of consciousness, as you mentioned. Um, in terms of a predictor of severity of recovery, um, a brief loss of consciousness, there was actually one study done that showed that it may actually predict a shorter recovery time. Um, interestingly, along with vomiting, which is an interesting one, I certainly, we always worry as an emergency physician, if I see somebody who comes in vomiting um, repeatedly with a head injury, those people, you know, get a CAT scan. Um, but uh, definitely, you know, what you learn is you treat each uh, patient individually. Each concussion in each individual is different. So, um, you know, sometimes a past, um, you know, recovery from an injury doesn't predict your next one. Um, so, again, about 20 to 30 percent, depending on which study you look at, uh, of people will have really prolonged symptoms, much more uh, in long in duration than, say, the normal one to four week recovery period of most concussions. Mm -hmm. So. Which I would guess could be a really frustrating process, not understanding how long that can take and, and people wanting to get back to you know, their life. It, it can be quite long then. Absolutely, and, and the kind of patients we end up seeing um, in the hospital, um, a lot of times uh, they have more moderate or severe traumatic brain injury, but even they have a lot of the same symptoms uh, that you mentioned once they've recovered a bit more. And so the challenge is trying to get them connected uh, once they're discharged from the hospital with resources uh, so that they don't uh, get lost um, in the care plan. So. so quite often people say, where do I even begin? And it probably should be with the Brain Injury Alliance. We hope so. Because we can connect people up on a gentle approach and not take away what they're still hoping for and what the caregivers are dealing with. And that way at least they can reach out to somebody, whether it's that day or whether it's three months down the road or a year down the road, then they know there's somebody to call. Mm -hmm. So they make that phone call. Where do you begin then to find them those resources? Actually, it depends. We set goals. And so oftentimes somebody will think that they have a problem with you know, needing a neuro neuropsychologist and in actuality they really need to get a primary care physician. So it's kind of weeding through to determine what the most important aspect is for resources. Mm -hmm. And then we go from there. Mm -hmm. So the team approach, as we mentioned off the top right. of the program, absolutely, is probably gonna come into play then. Right. Um, are women affected differently than men when it comes to brain injuries? You know, there's not enough studies on that topic in general, whether it's concussion or uh, traumatic brain injury that's more severe. Uh, more subgroup analysis of these larger studies need to be done, um, for sure. Okay, but we can see not only memory issues mm -hmm. and um, what we typically think of 
things that affect the brain, but also some, some of those physical um, things can start to happen as well. Describe some of the symptoms physically, Dr. Panos. Well, I mean, we, we certainly see a broad spectrum. Um, you know, someone who has severe headaches, for example, um, you know, they'll play a variable role in terms of how much someone can, you know, how quickly someone can recover. Um, certainly, you know, someone will have chronic nausea. Um, and then, you know, if that's not managed well, then they don't eat well, they don't hydrate, it makes it difficult for their body to recover. Um, you know, things like uh, difficulty with their balance, for example, would be a physical symptom. We see that often, and, and sometimes that's a hidden one. Um, you know, some are easy when someone comes in and holding on to someone, but frequently when you see even some of the, you know, concussions that people feel like they're doing reasonably well, when you get into some of the more uh, higher functions of the brain where it's coordinating a lot of different uh, inventories, um, you know, for example, like balances, you know, sight and um, the vestibular system and what we call proprioception, kind of position and pressure sensor on your body. It's a lot of data that's being coordinated. Um, they may be walking okay, not given any challenges, but the minute you give them any challenges, all of a sudden you find that their balance is really off. Well, that really puts them at greater risk for another fall. Um, or an injury, for example, driving, you know, we have to really make sure that people are ready to drive, um, which is a lot of multitasking and, and really requires a lot of different uh, systems to be able to, to be successful. So, um, you know, again, concussions can really mimic and, and are very broad. And oftentimes we have people coming in who have attributed their symptoms to a, a cold or a respiratory infection that they had. Or, you know, sometimes I get headaches after calculus tests. I didn't think it was that I got hit in the head, you know, in the softball game, so. Well, that's what I'm wondering is, you know, I, we've all hit our head at some point, you know, a little bump on the head kind of thing. How, how hard am I hitting my head? And then when do I start to notice some of those issues that might come into play from that blow to the head? It, that can be very confusing as well. True, yeah. Yeah, it really depends on, um, you know, how carefully you're following up with your primary care physician, uh, like we were talking about. Uh, a lot of it is being very aware and also uh, keying into your own health, um, you know, after something like that has happened. Mm -hmm. uh, particularly in the elderly population for us, mm -hmm. uh, we see a lot of uh, patients who have fallen and they have a lot of risk factors for falls to begin with. Um, and they have, um, you know, medications that thin their blood and, and so, um, you know, their, their threshold for needing to come in is a lot lower. And so we really advocate for elderly patients especially to come in if they have had an injury, a bruise on the head, anything that indicates to them that, you know, this is something more than just a, just a mild knock. Mm -hmm. so. We're also learning, too, that it's not always necessarily just a blow to the head. It can be um, the jerking motion from the, from the neck or spine, too, that can cause a brain injury. It can. Um, it, it doesn't have to be a direct blow to the head, that's true. If, it, if you have fast enough of a motion of the brain and of the head and it suddenly stops, that sudden stoppage without actually hitting something in can in itself cause uh, enough of a damage where you've now got a possibly a mild brain injury or a concussion. Mm -hmm. And I think some of that comes out of some of the, the sports research they're finding now, trying to make better helmets, but indeed it might not always be the the helmet. Right, and, and up till now there really hasn't been any definitive studies that have showed that helmets prevent concussions. Now, um, I always counsel parents, you know, if it's me, I'm putting my child in the best head protection I can. Um, but with the idea that I'm preventing other things, I'm preventing skull fractures, contusions, lacerations, um, and and hopefully in something mild, maybe, you know, I tell people no news is no news. If you bump your head a little bit and you have a helmet on, you probably won't notice anything. But, um, but certainly, you know, I always explain to people, we already have a helmet, right? It's called our skull. And it's really what's going on inside the skull where the activity is happening. And the, the brain is sort of floating in a little uh, milieu of water and, and cerebral spinal fluid. And, and it, uh, you know, when you apply forces to the head, as he said, um, you know, anything that causes it to bounce around in there is really uh, bringing about the injury. So, you know, oftentimes imaging is negative and um, mm -hmm. I think people want to see their, their concussion in a picture, but I always explain to them, if I can show you in a picture, you've got more than a concussion, so. Um, 
a good thing if it's not there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I right. always tell people, I hope your MRI is yeah. negative. But <laughs> well, we have an email coming in from Spokane. This person uh, would like to know, they say, I have a family member who had a brain injury 10 years ago. They are having trouble with memory, repeating conversations, and headaches, but doesn't want to see a doctor. Is there a test I can do at home to see how severe this might be? It sounds like they want to kind of pull, pull a fast one, but to find out more information, is there something this person can do to try to convince this uh, family member to go to the doctor? Anything? Well, I think if it's uh, affecting their activities of daily living, as we say, if it's starting to affect this, uh, this person's ability to do most, most things around the home or with the family, um, if it's a deterrent, um, uh, it may be highlighting those those uh, aspects of their life um, and, and saying that maybe these, these can be improved if you go in and, and, and get seen, that might be helpful. Of course, we don't know yeah. the age of the person and yeah. sometimes there's some confusion on dementia versus brain injury. Right, right, mm -hmm. and that's something that they're, they're not the same. And so if you've got an individual, it can exacerbate dementia, but uh, you really need to go see the doctor <laughs> That's all I could say. <laughs> yeah, uh, convincing that family member to go to the doctor yeah. would probably be the, the best uh, idea there. Well, well, knowing there really is some hope. I mean, you know, if it is a brain injury, oftentimes even th things you can do that don't require a lot of work and or medications can make a big difference in how someone responds post-injury uh, to their environment, kind of reducing the cognitive load that people have, mm -hmm. um, finding out how to you know, make their activities of daily living easier, you know, giving them strategies to deal with those things um, can give them relief from some of their symptoms that they may not think is available. So we always tell people don't suffer in silence, come on in and we're happy to take a look and try and figure things out. So. Yeah, we, we do want to get into the, the rehab piece especially here and there are so many ways that people can get a traumatic brain injury including a car wreck, a collision on the way home from uh, college sent a Spokane student to the ER with a brain injury. She's now back at school thanks to hard work and a team of therapists from St. Luke's who helped her start over. Sydney Ritter is a junior at WSU, a Chi Omega sorority member and a traumatic brain injury survivor. In November of 2015, a car accident left her in a coma. She awoke 10 days later, unable to walk or talk. I was basically an 18 year old baby. Sydney doesn't remember much about the wreck. I can remember everything from the car accident all the way up until like a half mile before it happened. Her next memories are as a patient at St. Luke's and the day she says her brain turned back on. That morning I woke up and I can picture it in my mind and I could see and my brain was remembering what I was seeing. Then I just started getting better faster. A team of therapists helped Sydney learn to walk. Sydney doing the bar. And talk. From there, it was learning things she'd known how to do most of her life. Relearning how to add and subtract. And then when I got that down, I had to relearn how to multiply. By her side, Paul Tippetts, a physical therapist with the Brain Injury Unit, who helps Sydney get ready for life outside the walls of St. Luke's. Doing a little shopping test. So I'm gonna give you this list. Right here that has some. There was uh, glimpses throughout there that um, with her personality, her motivation, um, things that she was remembering that we were telling her to do, uh, all those were uh, signs of her recovering and, and getting um, better to where she didn't need the inpatient therapy. Sydney was released after 22 days, ahead of schedule. She really surprised us all. From there, it was in-home and outpatient therapy. The following year, she was back at WSU and her sorority. My best friends are in the house, so they're always just looking out for me and making sure I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. When she returned to school, Sydney took a lighter class load, but tackled her studies like she'd always done. My processing speed is slow and I can't remember things as easily. My work ethic and my drive to do well hasn't changed. She's studying microbiology. I want to work with people with brain injuries. I'm not sure in what capacity. It's been a journey, supported by family, friends, and her team of specialists. They believed in me when I didn't really know what I was believing in. <laughs> to see her going back to school and 
doing things that she loves. Again, it's really inspiring. All right, now we're going to practice getting in and out of a vehicle. Sydney still gets headaches and continues with a variety of treatments. She's grateful for her recovery and wants people to know there's life after a brain injury. Just because you have a condition or an injury that sets you apart from other people, it doesn't mean you can't have just as like a fulfilling life as people who haven't been through traumatic experiences. A couple of things that struck me with Sydney's story. First of all, she has an amazing, amazing attitude. It's like once she started making progress, she was determined to just continue to progress and get back to school. How important is that? Uh, attitude is really important and family. Uh, a lot of our patients that do recover have those two uh, important guiding uh, lights or supports that help them in their recovery, having the right attitude and having family support. Uh, that is really important. Mm -hmm. And the support piece, I know, again, that's where the Brain Injury Alliance comes in, right. is making sure, because the caregivers, this can be very traumatic for, for family and caregivers as well. Absolutely, I, I was a caregiver. And first of all, you're overwhelmed, you don't know where to go, what to do, and it's nice to have somebody to reach out, even if all you do is just listen to what they have to say for a while, and then you work with them from that point forward. Mm -hmm. Her injuries were very severe. Very, very severe. Yes. And she came a long way in a short amount of time. She has, yes she has. Yeah. Do you often see that? The progress? Yeah. At that it's, level. It's sort of like Dr. Panos was saying, if you've seen one brain injury, you've seen one brain injury. So you just don't know. But I mean, I think the drive and the attitude and the family support really makes a big difference. And then, of course, your supporting medical staff is critical as well. Mm -hmm. She got back to school very quickly. Um, again, not, not typical. Is it, or I, I, I keep using the word typical, and, and there isn't anything typical about a brain injury. It's just hard to predict. Yeah. Um, you know, oftentimes what we try to do is really find out, you know, where is the person having their difficulties. If they're a student, we really look at, you know, what kind of things are they going to need to get back into school. So we write accommodations, basically academic accommodations. Um, if they're in the workplace, again, we try to do the same. Oftentimes, um, this is the one injury where I try to get people to return on a kind of a limited basis to try it out, you know, kind of find out what they can tolerate. Um, you know, any day that you, I sort of will use this term in, or you know, saying in my, my clinic, you know, once you've pushed on the bruise that day, it's one more day that the bruise has been pushed on. So if we can kind of make it so that, you know, we're accommodating the best we can so that, you know, yeah, that's going to be a little bit of work to get back, but, um, you know, can we make it so that they don't go home and then we miss the rest of the week or, um, you know, they can do something and, and still you know, be, feel successful with it. Um, if you push too hard, oftentimes people go back. So it's really finding that sort of pace back that each, each individual really uh, dictates. It's not you know, a, a generic thing. I have some people who just never miss a day of school or work, and mm. yet they have headaches and everything else. And, and yet others that you, know, you really have to work with them, and the teachers and the counselors and the school nurses and the administration and, you know, find a way to, to make it work for them. So, mm -hmm. And I imagine there are occasionally setbacks? Yes, you know, and we have to say that about all kinds of um, neurological injuries, whether it's stroke or trauma, that there'll be good days, there'll be bad days. Um, as a patient recovers, it really, uh, really can depend upon how they're feeling, um, you know, whether it's um, headaches that they're having or dizziness, some of those other symptoms that that linger on um, can can make the recovery um, a little bit more difficult. So, yeah. Well, and we saw yeah. that amazing facility at St. Luke's, or at least parts of it, in the story of, of, about Sydney. Talk about, um, and, and it basically deals with everything you'd have to deal with uh, in your daily life, mm -hmm. and those uh, rehab pieces that they put together there. Uh, St. Luke's has a is a great facility and has got a great setup. Uh, on it's both on the inpatient and the outpatient side. Uh, on the and uh, often they use services whether you're inpatient or an outpatient. Uh, you can use services on both sides. The pa they sometimes if there's a piece of equipment for a patient who's an inpatient, but they need it, but it's say in the outpatient clinic, they'll get the patient to that equipment or get the equipment to the patient. And the goal is to try and get the patient uh, you to, uh, as 
high and as good as they can get. And so whatever equipment we, they need to use, whatever services they can provide, uh, that's the goal. So as you saw on the video, there were, there's an entire section which has been converted into a mini grocery store. There's a bus, there's a, there's a, um, uh, I think it's a more a car or an SUV I don't know, I, or a minivan so you can get in and out of, so you can practice. Um, this is really helpful, especially in winter, rather than having the patient bring their vehicle in and do it in the snow, you can do it indoors. Um, if it's pleasant outside, we have us, the staff will take patient outdoors into the garden and have them walk around and do therapy out there. So that way you're getting your physical therapy, your occupational therapy, your recreational therapy outdoors. Um, and the advantage with that is also you're not cooped up inside all the time, especially uh, like this young lady who was cooped up, who was at St. Luke's for 22 days. Going outside helps. And um, also you have to remember prior to coming to St. Luke's, they'd have been at an acute care hospital, you know, having surgery for uh, another 10, 15 days. So it's a long time to be indoors. Typically, how long uh, would a, a day be for a patient then who's rehabbing? Um, Do they spend a few hours a day doing that? Uh, so, yes, we usually do about three hours of therapy, five days a week. Um, and then there are, so that includes physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech therapy. Um, uh, St. Luke's is fabulous in that it has a great recreational therapy department as well, which is an additional service they provide, which often doesn't, they don't get compensation for, but they found that it's so valuable where you know, recreational therapies where you do stuff either by yourself, with your family, with other patients, and whether it's playing cards, playing a guitar, listening to music, and that kind of livens up the day. So that's an additional service St. Luke's provides. Uh, in addition, then there are other services like uh, having chaplains come by, mm -hmm. which also is an additional service that St. Luke's provides. And it also has uh, dietitians coming in all, the, you know, in between those three hours of therapy. You've got the, uh, uh, the psychologist or the neuropsychologist coming in. So while it is three hours, when you add all that in it, it turns out to be a full day. Uh, especially for someone who's recovering from a brain injury who can get exhausted, so you have to space all that out. For family members and caregivers, and those frustrations that might come into play taking care of someone, what, su what support is there for them? We actually have a caregiver support group that is held at St. Luke's, and it's on a, a Wednesday, and actually the caregiver and the survivor groups meet at the same time, so that People don't have to try and juggle and accommodate for the individuals. And discussions are based around what the caregivers need. And then there's other things such as the adult day help through Providence, which is an assistive situation. Some people like that, some don't. There's a, a variety of things in the community. It just depends on the level of severity of the situation. Mm -hmm. Ramona, take us inside one of those um, therapy sessions or one of those support group sessions. What typically would we hear um, some of the well, the Caregivers individual that actually uh, handles that tries to gear it to the group that's there that day. Mm -hmm. So if somebody actually has a, a problem with their patient, their, their loved one, uh, then that might be the topic of discussion for the whole evening. Or a guest speaker can be brought in. And it's just, it's actually sort of like the, there's no typical uh, time for those caregivers. And we try and accommodate whatever they need, as well as the survivors. Mm -hmm. What kind of follow-up does a patient need and for how long after a brain injury? And <laughs> well, that, again, the question is an individual Here I go question. Again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I have some people I've seen for several years and um, I have some people I'll see for maybe one or two visits. Um, and again, it's just trying to find traction, trying to find right. what gets them there. I think fundamentally there's sort of a certain core uh, number of things at least that I counsel my patients to do. Um, again, you know, try to make sure that they have sort of a, a healthy environment for their brain to heal, um, not only in terms of what they're doing or exposed to, but also how they're taking care of their bodies, the sleep that they get, the way they eat, um, whether they're getting some activity, you know, some light exercise. Um, you know, I actually counsel a few vitamins that give people a little bit more energy and um, can help with things like headaches. So, um, I, you know, I think that Everybody responds a little differently. Fortunately, at least from concussion standpoint, the vast majority recover relatively quickly. 
again, there's that 20 to 30 percent who don't, though, and those are the ones we really work with. Um, interestingly, a lot of the people I get from the neurosurgeons, um, subarachnoid bleeds, subdurals, um, skull fractures, um, at least the ones that you know are, do better and don't need to go to St. Luke's or an inpatient setting. Um, you know, I find probably almost about the same recovery rate mm -hmm. as I find with my concussions. And sometimes I've got somebody who's, you know, dri driving me nuts to go snowboarding. And I'm like, no, you still have a skull fracture and there's still, because they, you know, blood they, on your brain. They and might feel I, fine. I know you feel great, but yeah. you got to wait a little bit. And yeah. So. Well, that, that kind of goes to the, the email that we just got from Ruth here in Spokane who says, are there any superfoods that help brain injury patients recover faster? And you mentioned you you prescribe some vitamins, different things. Yeah, I think it's a good idea. I mean, the brain is highly metabolic. Um, I think in one study I saw, or there's thought to be 20% of your your actual caloric intake is used to power your brain. You know, considering it's a little bigger than your fist, it's you know taking a lot of energy to run it. Um, and so it's not good to not have a good source of calories. So. You know, in terms of just basic diet, I usually counsel people to try and, you know, get in good lasting calories, complex carbohydrates, um, you know, whole grains, um, you know, having a good breakfast every morning, start the day, fruits, vegetables, you know, lean meats, fish. I, you know, tell them to use good oils in their cooking. There's certainly a number of things like olive oil and, and avocado oil that are probably better than using processed oils. Um, and I definitely, you know, talk to them too about uh, the importance of staying hydrated, um, and I do, like I said, I give them some options for some common vitamins. Uh, you know, I'll give people an option to take some magnesium, which um, is kind of a neurologist trick to help a little bit with headaches. And there's been some studies that show it helps with focus and, mm. and calming people a little bit. And um, I've been using, you know, omega-3 fish oil for quite a long time. Um, you know, I think the studies are a little variable on it, but in clinical practice, it was the first thing we kind of recommended. People felt like it really helped. Um, mm -hmm. You know, CoQ10 is another thing that, you know, kind of helps a little bit with headache uh, intensity. I, you know, give people a little B vitamin or B complex to get them a little bit of energy mm -hmm. in the morning. Um, I encourage them to have a good probiotic in their diet, whether they're eating yogurt or taking a probiotic, just to have a healthy immune system um, and a little bit of vitamin D, you know. I mean, so it's it's pretty common things that I recommend. Um, but, you know, again, I, I, people need to take care of, you know, the, themselves if they want their their concussion to heal and if they're not doing things like sleeping well and um, you know eating well and and trying to limit the the cognitive load they put on you know stay away from too many screens and um, those types of things mm -hmm. I you know what about what about recovery. exercise because some of this some of the brain injuries may have happened from from a, a sports injury but staying active is that important kind of finding where your limit is yeah, we, we uh, often um, say that the brain is like a muscle. You do have to exercise it, whether you're an elderly patient uh, dealing with dementia or a patient who's had a traumatic brain injury. I agree that making sure that you're using your mind and practicing you know, um, the usual things that you do at home, uh, as well as, as maybe challenging it um, uh, as you recover, will help, help in your recovery. So physical exercise, mental, you know, um, exercise, so to speak, uh, it's all, all great in your recovery as well. Mm -hmm. What might be some of those mental exercises? Um, there are quite a few. It uh, depends on the person's interest. Some people like doing Sudoku, some don't, and uh, some like, uh, you know, numbers. So Sudoku, or I tell them get a fourth grade or a fifth grade math textbook from <laughs> their kid or their grandkid and work through those. Some hate numbers, so then they go to solitaire. Uh, others would prefer stuff like you know something uh, like meditation or tai chi because they feel that helps them focus their mind. So it depends on you know the patient. We try and tailor the uh, activity for the patient, and the goal is that we want to get them involved and get them to do it and incorporate it into their life, and not look at it as okay, it's a chore that I have to yeah. do and check off, and in three months I'm never going to do this again. <laughs> We have a phone call from Richard in Kalispell. Richard, thank you so much for waiting. Good evening. Hi there. Hi. Do you have a question? My question is, how do you get workman's comp to quit dragging their feet? Because my son has been told that there are certain things he needs to get done, and by the time uh, these people get around to okaying it, it's you know two or three or four weeks later. 
any suggestions along that line? Mm -hmm. Ramona. I wish I had a good answer for that, but when you're dealing with labor and industries or any government agency, the process is interminable. And all I can say is to make sure and fill out the paperwork, do exactly what they tell you to do, keep copies of everything, and make sure that you follow up. The squeaky wheel gets the grease. And, uh, but it is a sad state. I, I understand your problem. In fact, there's a lot of that piece, whether it's workman's comp or sure. just getting back to work, working with the employers. Right, right. Well, insurance is a big issue, too. Depending on what the individual has, that can limit what they're avail what's available for them, uh, even in housing placement. And going back to work, hopefully somebody will get a hold of me before they try and go back and work it themselves, because it's important that those be accommodated immediately and not at a later date, because then they can just say, well, we, we just don't need you any longer. Mm -hmm. so. And Dr. Panos, can you speak to, um, we're hearing so much now with football players, players that played many years ago, some taking their own lives, the connection between those traumatic brain injuries and those suicides. Can we connect the two? Uh, well, yeah. The, the issue that the NFL is dealing with is something called chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Um, we know there's a relationship. We haven't fully established what that relationship is, but we know that certainly a brain that's subjected to repeated hits, whether it's, you know, true concussions or even subconcussive, meaning just repeated, you know, hits that don't necessarily bring about uh, true concussive symptoms but happen over time, uh, can potentially be responsible for this. It's actually uh, an abnormal protein that gets deposited in the brain and sort of gets in the way of the normal uh, traffic patterns in the brain. And, um, and unfortunately, it uh, leads to, you know, aggressiveness, um, inability to hold thoughts, um, depression, again, as you pointed out, uh, at times suicide. Um, the, an individual concussion, you know, I would get that question a lot from parents. If, if my son who's, you know, 12 gets a concussion, do I need to pull him out so he doesn't get chronic traumatic encephalopathy someday or get what the NFL players get? I don't know that we can say that for sure is the situation, but certainly, you know, I give people caution if you start having multiple concussions, especially at a young age, or you continue to, to be subjected to those, uh, you know, persistent impacts, it does place you at risk. There's probably some, uh, you know, genetics to it, although interestingly, the, you know, the numbers are um, at least in some studies quite significant coming out of the, the retired players. Um, I've worked with some of those guys. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's a def definitely a difficult subject and, um, you know, a lot of feelings on both sides. And you can see, you know, the, the controversies with the NFL as well as, you know, really what things like amateur sports, you know, for example, avoiding heading the ball at certain ages in soccer or, you know, when is it time for kids to actually play tackle football um, versus, you know, should we be having younger kids play flag football instead? Um, I think those are all the, the issues to... To mm -hmm. me to the education piece is very big right now right? in making sure that people understand um, what we're talking about when we talk about brain injury. Right. Yeah. We have uh, Joanne here in Spokane. Hi, Joanne. Hi. You have a question? Well, I wanted to know if there's something other than being treated for what I'm being treated for. I was signed up to come to St. Luke's, but I haven't made it there yet. But I have a back injury that happened, and I have a neck injury, and I have a, a torn rotary cuff, and I have two knees that need to be taken care of. How do I get help for all this when we're in the preliminaries forever, it seems like, because we can't get any further, and it is all state industrial related. Hmm. Any advice for Joanne? Um, the, I found my patients and uh, I've, I found it really helpful when we've got a good nurse case manager that helps coordinate and care and gets the LNI or labor and industries, uh, you know, the, uh, the case manager there involved. So usually they assign a nurse case manager for a patient or you can ask to have a nurse case manager assigned to you. And that is a great resource to have. It's, uh, it's like having someone in your corner doing all the work uh, getting all the, you know, making all the connections, 
getting everyone involved, making sure the appointments are done, the follow-ups are there. If there are any recommendations that they have to go back to the LNI for approval, the a nurse case manager will do that for the mm. patient. And uh, so th the first step I would say is to ch see who you, the patient's uh, nurse case manager, LNI, is assigned, or if they haven't assigned one, ask LNI to assign one. So she starts with LNI by asking for a nurse case manager. Right. Not calling St. Luke's and asking for a nurse case manager. <laughs> no, okay, no, yeah. That's, we want to be clear on that. Okay. <laughs> um, again, another frustration, Ramona, for patients. Yes, I mean, there's just, especially when you have multiple issues like that, and you have to determine which is going to take precedence over the other. And with this lady, I'm not too sure which happened first or you know, I'd have to look mm. at the paperwork, but I agree, Doctor, like Dr. D'Souza said, get a nurse case manager from labor and industries and speak up as to what you need and what your issues are. Mm -hmm. you, you need to be your own advocate or find someone who can be your advocate. Correct, that's, that's so true. And oftentimes people don't know how to be an advocate for themselves. So that's why there's nurse case managers, that's why the Brain Injury Alliance is available, so that we can actually, and I mean, there's even guardians where if they hit a wall, then I'll take over from there and, and push it a little further, so that there's not too many people in the mix, because that can create issues as well. Mm -hmm. Because this can go on for so long, it must get costly. If it's labor and industries, then labor and industries is paying for it, so to speak. Uh, what it gets is frustrating and it makes getting better more difficult because you've got depression and you've got issues with money and you don't have the income and you've got the pain and so it's, it's compounded and that's where you kind of need to take care of yourself. Like the doctors have been saying, you really need to manage your own self as well beyond the issues that you're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. What do educators need to know? What do employers need to know when they have someone that's working for them, and this might be a slower process getting that employee back, which creates frustration on their side. But what do they need to know? How do we educate the employers and the, um, the, the educators out there about brain injury? Well, the biggest takeaway, I think, for me, to, for the viewers to, to have, is that this is um, you know, a long process. For, for some patients, it's true they recover very quickly and they're very fortunate. Uh, the example that we saw in the video, that's you know, a, a wonderful, wonderful thing to see, um, but um, quite a few patients continue to have symptoms that affect the way uh, they, li they live their lives at home and um, may make it more difficult for them to return to work. And so just being uh, understanding and um, maybe working with their HR to maybe um, have a, um, a graded way of having their employees come back to work. And this is very true with a lot of our patients, whether it's back injury or head injury, we, we are happy to write letters to help support those, those um, patients get back to work um, if they can. Mm -hmm. so. I, I know this is a big topic for you, Dr. Panos, is making it, sure it, people understand. Yeah, it seems to be getting to be bigger. As a matter of fact, I had a conversation with uh, an employer today about bringing uh, an employee back in the healthcare field. And um, uh, a good example is several years ago, I had an uh, intensive care unit nurse who came back from a concussion. And her fears were, number one, they wanted her to just return to full time. Um, and she really had a fear that I'm working in a very high acuity area. I'm worried I'm going to make a mistake. I make mistakes at home. I forget mm -hmm. things at home. How am I going to step into that environment? And so one of the things I did was I advocated with her employer, which fortunately was my employer, and uh, asked that you know she be allowed to do some shadow shifts, you know some uh, you know, reduced hour shadow shifts, just to to again get uh, a feel for the environment again, uh, to start turning the, the wheels that hadn't been turned in a while, um, and it was really helpful to her. And then she was able to again return with knowing that she had some support staff mm -hmm. to work with her when she was kind of more on her own, she had you know, resources in place that she could call on. Um, and again, we started with you know, some reduced hours and then got her back. And, well, and it has I, to help her confidence as well. Absolutely. Which has been shaken. Well, and I think you know, the problem with these injuries is the organ that makes sense of it all is the organ that's injured. 
And so, you know, when you have doubts in your own mind, when your family's telling you, you know, mom always forgets, it's, you know, scary to go back to that, you know, environment sometimes in work. And so I think if employers are willing to not take the ploy that they're, I don't want them back till they're 100%, with concussions, that might be a long time. You know, if you if you can get them back in, uh, you know, again, it's it's that concept. If you take someone who's been out for several months and you just drop them into the deep end, you know, to say, okay, you're doing eight hours a day for yeah. the next five days, and you know, all of a sudden they're sitting in front of a computer screen again, or or you know, answering the phone 38 times and multitasking, that can be really overwhelming. And and these are processing injuries to a great extent. So if your brain you know, suddenly gets overwhelmed, um, not only is what the task you're charged with doing going to be messed up, but so is everything else. So, um, you know, we hear about irritability or sadness that yeah. people have. Well, your emotions are a function of your brain. If your brain is being overwhelmed by work, um, yeah, your emotions aren't going to process very well either. And so, so again, it really, you know, takes that collaborative effort to get people back. Um, you know, the, the workman's compensation issue, um, you know, I've had to do a lot of talking with the folks at L and I or, or uh, State Insurance Fund. Um, there are a lot of delays, and and these are really time sensitive injuries. You know, if if the majority do get better in a short time, that's if they get the proper support. And mm -hmm. and so oftentimes, if you know we feel it necessary to use a prescriptive medication, that's great. But they can't you know have it approved. But then. They don't get the approval for the refill, and now all of a sudden they're out of the medicine for a week. Or, um, you know, you put in for you know some speech or occupational or physical therapy. And, and fortunately, at Kootenai, we have you know a very similar program where we have a very multi-collaborative effort and a lot of uh, great people who work together to try and get these people back. But if it takes you know four weeks to get an approval, you know that's four weeks down the road yeah. in an injury where really you've lost time, you know, providing that patient some. Uh, some ability to, to rehab and, and get better. And, you know, in the end, I think it, it actually probably costs the workers more mm -hmm. time loss because there is a, a difficult time getting timely approval, you know, timely response. Um, and again, you know, they're suffered from a brain injury. So these are very frustrating things for them as well as for us. So, yeah. Well, we want to try and sneak in a couple more phone calls. Eileen in Calgary. Hi, Eileen. Thank you for waiting. Hi. Um, I, good evening. I have a history of encephalitis when I was in my late teens, uh, followed by um, migraine with an aura which, which, in which I, I would not be able to see anything momentarily. Then later I had menin lymphocytic meningitis with a non-paralytic polio confirmed by lumbar puncture, uh, then followed this in much later, um, four, four concussions, three of which incurred a loss of consciousness. Since had that, many years later, I've had a diagnosis of uh, benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. I still get periods of dizziness and vertigo. I can no longer do the Epley maneuver for the, the, the BPPV because I have neck problems mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it, I, it's very painful to turn my neck sharply. So, Eileen, are so you looking... So what do I do? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh my, um, <laughs> doctor. <laughs> well, um, I think that that is something that um, an ENT colleague might be able to help you with. Have you seen an ENT specialist in the past? Eileen, are you still there? No, yes, I, don't. I am. Oh. I am. I have seen ENT um, years ago. <laughs> okay. Um, Besides seeing an ENT specialist, I think a rehab uh, specialist might also be very useful uh, in maybe teaching you some other exercises and things that, I mean, I use the word exercise, but really techniques to help try to um, get rid of those symptoms. And vertigo is um, quite common. We mentioned that earlier, and she says she has bouts of vertigo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which can be very debilitating. And... Um, 
yeah, not easy to deal with. And any of her symptoms, my goodness. Um, we are getting uh, close to the, uh, to the end of the program. I, I want to leave the viewers tonight with some final thoughts from each of you, what you would like them to know on the topic of brain injury and concussion um, before we sign off tonight. And Dr. Panos, I'll start with you. Okay. Um, well, certainly one of the things I advocate for that, you know, everybody needs to be at least knowledgeable about the injury. Um, you know, certainly parents need to be um, aware and knowledgeable and able to hopefully recognize things. I think our athletes, our kids, um, you know, need to be able to recognize the symptoms. And often I counsel them, look, you know, if you get an injury, you know, pull yourself out, go to the trainer, go to the coach, um, because even though you may be out for this portion of the game, it's going to be a lot easier to get you back than to compound the injury by staying in. Um, I think, you know, coaches need to be working with us um, and, you know, understanding the importance. And I'm very lucky in, in North Idaho with my coaches um, being very supportive. Uh, I think, you know, having a good uh, surrounding uh, body of people, trainers, nurses, uh, educators, um, everyone, you know, really being there for, for a group effort, but, but most importantly, you know, recognizing the injury and, and taking care of it. Because again, um, you know, my, my practice has gone from a lot of, you know, very short lived sports concussions now to a lot of the more complicated things that haven't gotten better when my colleagues have tried taking care of them. And, and there's a lot out there. And so these are injuries that you hope okay. you can prevent or at least treat to, to minimize the, the long-term consequences. So. Okay, Ramana. I agree. I think educating yourself on what's going on with you and don't hesitate to speak out. You need to ask whether it's your primary care physician or, or whomever, but you need to get some help and reach out and get those resources to you so that you don't go on suffering because it's not worth it. And there are resources out there and there's, the medical community is phenomenal. So okay. reach out and ask. Dr. DeSouza. Um, I'd say Family support, number one, is the most important thing. And number two would be having a good primary care provider. That's going to be your quarterback. Uh, so making sure you're, you have a primary care provider, and if you're well and healthy, see them at least once a year so you're continuing to establish care. So should something like a concussion or a brain injury happen, you have them in your corner. All right. I couldn't agree more. I think primary care before and after the injury is, is exceedingly important. Um, both preventative uh, measures of you know, making sure that you are uh, cognizant of ways in which to prevent falls from standing, injuries from being in motor vehicles or motorcycles or a lot of the other um, um, ways in which we injure ourselves um, uh, out in the world. And then also making sure to follow up with your primary care physician if you are injured, if you leave the hospital, please, please, please follow up with your with your primary care physician. Okay, good advice from all of you. Thank you so much. And that will do it for this edition of Health Matters. Thanks to our panel for a great discussion. And our thanks to everyone who called or emailed in your questions. I'm Teresa Lukens. For all of us at KSPS, we appreciate you watching tonight. Thanks so much. Health Matters is made possible by our viewers, the friends of KSPS, and by Providence Healthcare. I'm Dr. Andrew Boulay, and when my wife had a cardiac arrest, I chose Providence because I knew that everything we needed for her complex care was available, from the emergency room to radiology to the nursing staff to the specialists we needed for her care. I'm Arnie Peterson, and I'm an orthopedic surgeon, and I work at Sacred Heart for Providence Medical Group. When I needed my hip replaced, I chose Providence because of the professionalism and the care that I knew I'd receive. I never thought twice about going anywhere else.